Greetings, friends. We're going to begin. I'm Connie Vanderakis with Danceability International and Disability Pride PA. Uh, Dis uh, Danceability International was an award-winning program at the Zero Project in 2019. I'm a white woman with a black turtleneck, gray middle-length hair, and green earrings for the conference. Our panel, Let's Talk About Dis Disabled Sex, reinforces sustainable global go goals by the United Nations for all genders and gender identities, specifically 3.7, universal access to sexual and reproductive health services, 5.6, universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. And Article 25 of the CRPD, Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. Today you will hear from five panelists and my co-moderator in Australia, Patsy Frawley. Um, you will hear from the Netherlands, Indonesia, Cameroon, which will be online, Singapore, and the United States of America. Each panelist has five minutes to introduce their organization, and then they will introduce uh, the next panelist. After each person has um, provided us information about their panel, we have some questions that Patsy will give us. So welcome to the session. We're grateful for this conference and for this topic. Um, so I'd like to introduce Patsy Frawley, all the way from Australia, which I think it's midnight there. Hello, um, can you hear me, Connie? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patsy Frawley. Um, I'm an Associate Professor of Disability Inclusion at the University of Waikato in New Zealand, so kia ora. Um, but I'm currently back in my home country of Australia for a week, so um, I'm um, zooming in to you from a very small country town in the centre of the state of Victoria, right down the bottom of Australia. Um, I uh, have light coloured hair and glasses and um, a big red glass pendant on from New Zealand. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here this evening to um, participate in this um, session and uh, to work with people here, hearing what you've um, achieved and the work, the great work that you're doing, and also have a conversation about the importance of sexuality rights um, for people with disabilities and how your programs are doing, the, do, do, uh, progressing these rights. Um, so thank you all for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Without further ado, I'll introduce the first panelist, Laura Honders. Yeah, thank you, Connie. Uh, my name is Laura Honders. Uh, I am a young woman of 28 years old. I wear a red blouse and I have blonde curly hair. I represent the Liliana Fonds and uh, will present the Body Talk program. Uh, the Liliana Fonds is a Dutch gov governmental organization that opens the world for children and young people with a disability. We work according to a com community-based rehabilitation approach with local partners in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Our thematic areas are sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, livelihoods, education, transport, and communication and rehabilitation. So <clears throat> the sexual and reproductive health and rights of children and young people with a disability are, very, uh, are getting hardly any attention uh, at schools. At home, it's uh, often not discussed, and healthcare providers are not able to provide inclusive services to children and young people with a disability. It's not seen as a natural and integral part of life, and there's a gap between sexual and reproductive health and rights services, which often overlook people with disabilities, and disability services and support that often do not integrate SRHR. 
Um, we think that the problem towards inaccessible SRHR uh, is caused partly by the inaccessible information and services, but there are multiple layers to the problem. There's a lot of stigma and taboo when the topics of sexuality and disability are combined. There's very little knowledge and skills on how to discuss it. Uh, if it comes to disability inclusive communication, um, sex positive communications, and a rights-based approach. People with a disability have low self-esteem because it's uh, often not discussed, and there's finger pointing about whose responsibility it is to discuss uh, sexuality with people with disabilities. Therefore, we came up with a body talk program, which aims at children and young people with a disability have equitable access to sexual and reproductive health and rights services and information and opportunities to enjoy these rights. It does so by a multi-sectoral and community-based approach, a training of trainers, and focus on awareness raising and advocacy aimed at behavior change and the change in mindsets. It's currently implemented in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. So we see that sexuality is an integral part of life, also of people with disabilities. Therefore, it needs an integral approach in the support that children and young people with a disability receive. We focus on value-based messaging in communications and advocacy, and aim to bridge the gap between policies and platforms aimed at both sexual and reproductive health and rights services, as well as policies and platforms aimed at disability inclusion. A way to do so uh, is the manual that we produced, uh, where we combine the expertise of community-based uh, solutions with rights-based and sex-positive ways of communicating about SRHR. It's based on existing modules, but adapted to be disability inclusive, to mainstream SRHR, and it's adaptable to local contexts. Our intended impact are the following uh, points. I say intended because we still need one and a half years to finish this program. Um, it's uh, the uh, uh, intended impact in the end is that all sectors that interact with people with disabilities are able to uh, integrate sexual and reproductive health and rights in their services. So sustainability and next steps. To, in order to be sustainable, it needs to be integrated in the activities of all the involved partners and stakeholders, uh, including an emphasis on collaboration and referral uh, with community actors. We train a local pool of facilitators that can roll out the program, and we work closely with the government. Um, due to time, I will no, not go into next steps, but I want to invite you to the impact transfer forum pitches, <laughs> um, which will start uh, in an hour, where I will uh, more in depth present the Body Talk program and our next steps for scaling. Thank you. Uh, and then I want to hand over the clicker to Nonna, <laughs> or Ruhel Jabroi, who is working for NLR Indonesia, one of our partners in the Body Talk program, um, and the program officer for the wonderful program she is going to introduce. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a project and team and guesting guests from the across of the world. Uh, I'm Ruhel Jabloi, uh, Asian woman wearing the cream color blazer, long hair and black hair, have a long and black hair. I will introduce, um, we are from NLR Indonesia and working for leprosy and disability in Indonesia. We work to fulfill rights of people and with, uh, with disability and leprosy, including of issue of sexual and reproductive health. It was honored to be invited to talk about My Body is Mine project that encourage children and young people with disability and affected by leprosy to feel free, fulfilled in their sexual and reproductive whole life. We believe that children and youth with disability and affected by leprosy the same right as without children with, uh, without children with disability to live dignified, healthy life and to be safe for all of the violence. S since 28, NLR Indonesia have been implementing the My Body is Mine project supported by Liliana Foundation an MBIM project objective to improve accessibility inclusive HRHR information and services for children and youth with disability and affected by leprosy. The intervention consists to promotion of comprehensive sexuality education in school and community inclusive and youth friendly services model in community health center. 
Our innovation as aspect is HR HR training for teacher and health worker, forum parents group and champion group to support each other and discuss HR HR issue. We develop of guidebook to teach HR HR for children with disability and affected by leprosy. Result and significant change, like in Indonesia, school implementing comprehensive sexuality education for children and affected by leprosy, inclusive youth friendly services at the community health center provide HRHR through the youth posiando or we call mobile clinic. Parents and community at the village are committed to provide early sex education in their family. How we learn, lesson learn to our project My Body is Mine, children and youth with disability and leprosy speak up about HRHR in the public. They are brief to report case of sexual harassment. And then this is one life story, uh, life story from our champion, Gabby, is 21 years old, young woman, uh, affected by leprosy. Now she active to speaking up and advocacy on, on HRHR to government. Gabby has always inspiring young women to be empowered. Women have to write to enjoy their sexual life, taking care of themselves, get married and have a family, regretting of whatever they are people affected by leprosy or people with disability. And this is our sustainability, the teacher consistent provide HRHR education integrate with learning at the school. The health worker provide youth friendly services on mobile clinic for children and youth with disability and affected by leprosy on a regular schedule. In the challenge, in Indonesia, there are no policy at the national or local level to support the implementation of HRHR. This way, HRHR is not priority for children and youth with disability and affected by leprosy. And then unavailability on financial resources to continue implementing that good practice. I think that back to struggle in the field passing in the issue implemented, it's bring me to share this message with everyone. Getting good things will continue to grow. We believe that what we do from the heart will impact and benef benefit those with disability. We will continue to support youth and ch children with disability and affected by leprosy to have the same access to SRHR. Thank you. And I will introduce my next finalist, uh, in online, uh, she is a wonderful woman, uh, wor works for sexual and reproductive health in Cameroon. Please. We can hear uh, Lillian. Hello everyone, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. I am Lilian Dibo Ayong, and the CEO and founder of Lilian Dibo Association, which is based in Cameroon. We are mostly focused on the affairs of women and girls with disability, because we believe that they are the most marginalized and they are always left behind when programs and services are concerned that are being offered in the society. Next slide, please. Lilian Dibo Association was founded on March 2020, and it was legally registered on May 2022. And uh, we have our thematic areas, which is disability rights advocacy, economic empowerment, sexual and reproductive health rights for women and girls with disability, gender-based violence, which is one of our most recent uh, areas of focus, education where we give scholarship to children with disability and children of parents with disability and public speaking where we uh, build the capacities of uh, adolescent girls with disability and adolescent girls born from parents with disability to be bold enough to speak in the society to own their voice and to create change using their voices next slide please our most recent uh, project was disability uh, voices against rape before we carried out this, uh, pro this project, we realized that women and girls with disability in Cameroon, in particular where I live, have been raped and they have been sexually abused, yet their voices 
have, have been seized because they are not bold enough, they are not confident enough to meet people and tell them that this thing has happened to me, whereas the repercussion of this rape and sexual harassment is killing them mentally and um, uh, um, physically, if I may say. And uh, we carried out this uh, Disability Voices Against Rape last year uh, in April. Uh, we were funded by Rescue Women Cameroon, that's a women-led organization here in Cameroon, and 20 women and girls with disability uh, of registered for this event, and we built their capacities of the, on the dangers of rape, how rape can be reported, how possible perpetrators can be identified, and what should be done in order to avoid their own children, that's women and girls with disability, their children who are also vulnerable because of the fact that they are born from parents with disability. We taught them all these things on how to uh, fight against rape in their communities, and we later on carried out radio programs to reach out to the communities for them to stand as allies with these women in order to help them fight against rape. Next slide, please. Importance of DIVA. Why was DIVA very important as disability voices against rape? Now, we realize that um, from, from calls reaching us from the office, at uh, the office, sorry, uh, we tend to understand that so many of these women have these stories with them, and it keeps killing them every every hour of the day, yet they cannot speak it out because the society has built this wall of uh, even you, you are you have a disability and you don't have like you cannot attract men to an extent of sexually harassing you, whereas these women and girls are sexually harassed, harassed every hour of the day. So our organization tends to address this rape on women and girls with disabilities in Cameroon to give back their voice. First, that is the importance. We built a, a room for storytelling because we believe that storytelling is the first step of their healing process. So we built that, that a platform for them to tell their stories in order to have that first healing before going to the next step, like reporting cases and having the perpetrators are arrest, arrested. We built, uh, we had to rebuild uh, the confidence and uh, restore the power of speaking out. Now, these women could not speak out because they believe that nobody will listen to them. They believe that their voices are not important. Why? Because of their disability. So we had to, to try to erase, we had to start to erase that aspect of them seeing themselves as people who are not fit in the society, giving them back that voice and confidence and giving them the power to speak out and using their voices to shun uh, rape and sexual harassment perpetrated on women and girls with disability. And at the end of uh, the of the project, we ensured that we gave financial assistance to four uh, women and girls with disability who are rape survivors, who had more vulnerable situations. They, they are financially incapable to cater for themselves, and we had to give them this financial assistance in order to uh, help them carry uh, open businesses that will cater for, the, for their needs, that will also as well cater for the needs of their children, for those who have children, and to give them this financial independence because it will boost them mentally to, to know that they have the financial need to take care of their of their selves of themselves. Next slide, please. What was the innovative part of this of this uh, uh, project? Now there is, I would say, without any fear or favor, that in Cameroon there is no organization that has particularly addressed this problem of women and girls with disability being raped or sexually harassed. We were the first organization to address this aspect of women uh, of rape perpetrated on women and girls with disability. And it was an eye-open opener in the society. Where, where was the innovation part of it? We had to give them business startups to these rape survivors because we needed, we needed them to gain their financial independence. We had to partner with other grassroots organizations of persons with disability. And we believe that as the project continues in the next, in the next years, we are going to partner with more 
women with disability led organizations in order for them in all the 10 regions of Cameroon because the devour was limited just in Southwest and in Kumba in particular. So we intend to go further to increase our impact, getting involved all women and girls with disability who are interested in shunning rape from the 10 regions of Cameroon for them to stand as active agents of change and let their voices be heard. Liliana. Storytelling is not. I'm sorry, um, we, we have to move on to the next uh, panelists, but please stay with us to answer questions. Sorry. Okay, I would like to introduce our Marisa. Hi, hi, thank you. So uh, my name is Marissa. I am a 42-year-old woman with short, dark hair, and I'm wearing a black shirt and blazer. I'm going to be talking about disordinary love which is run by the Disabled People's Association in Singapore. So how we started. Um, we started with a sexuality educator and counselor, uh, Dr. Martha Tara Lee, and she came to us with the idea of hosting sex education talks with persons with disabilities because existing classes in Singapore were about personal hygiene, safety, and biological aspects of puberty and reproduction. So she wanted to give a more robust um, education. In 2019, we did a pilot workshop with Dr. Martha Tarley, and we decided to go first with parents because they were the gateway to kind of getting um, children, to, uh, young adults, sorry, to come into these workshops. So we started with 20 adults, uh, person, parents of persons with disabilities, and uh, the enthusiasm of the participants led to DPA running workshops and individual counseling sessions that covered topics such as positivity, body positivity, personal rights, boundaries, sexual health, sexuality, and relationships for both parents and youth with disabilities in separate sessions. So what is the Disordinary Love? It is a holistic sexuality resource that offers a safe space to explore learn and have dialogues about disability, sex and relationships. We hope that through engagement with the platform and our workshops, we aim to increase persons with disabilities confidence to have conversations about sex and feel empowered to be better informed about the topic. We hope to encourage other organizations as well in educational institutions, first in Singapore and hopefully people like our project elsewhere, to offer holistic sex education for persons with disabilities. In the first phase, Disordinary Love offered one-to-one -one counseling sessions to participants, um, and also we had workshops. Disordinary Love also par partnered with the state courts in Singapore to offer young offenders and their families um, access to one-to-one -one counseling, and they received support that aimed to provide them with healthier understandings of relationship and practical coping mechanisms in everyday lives. None of this was, this was all covered by a grant, so nobody who, and who came to the workshops or the counseling sessions had to pay for it. So how do you access the Disordinary Love re, um, resources? So we're on Instagram, uh, at Disordinary Love, and there you can find information, quotes, and articles from persons with, dis with disabilities and easy to read resources. It's a work in progress, so if you go there and you have feedback, please do send it in. And we also have a YouTube page, um, on you, where it's called At Disordinary Love as well, where we host recordings of previous workshops so people can engage with the content at their own pace and their own time. So this is Conversations Over Craft, and there's a picture here of two people um, crafting at a table. Um, and we shared a quote from two of the one of the participants. Um, Crafting paper flowers was a great way to medi meditate and reflect upon the issues surrounding LGBTQ plus and disability. The session was engaging and we learned a lot. So that was one version of the workshops that we do. So what's next for Disordinary Love? Um, because of Zoom fatigue during the COVID-19 pandemic it meant that DPA had to adapt how we'd engage with the disability community. So after laying the groundwork with the on online workshops that we did and the individual sessions, now we're focusing on building up our online resources and collaborating with other partners to extend the reach and impact of the program. 
through building up a, a website because obviously it's great to have it on social media, but it's not as easy to search. So we want to have a place to, to lock everything into a website that people can uh, find more easily and to develop um, those conversations over craft workshops um, so that we can uh, address other intersectional identities with disabilities such as LGBTQI+, race, and various other identities that people want to share about. So that's a very quick rundown about it, but if you want to discuss more, please find me on the app. Thank you. Now I'd like to pass it over to Daniela Decker. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniela Decker. And today you heard from agencies from all over the world and organizations looking to increase disability and sexuality all around the world. Yet what we're still lacking is that representation today in media and in the, within the marketing landscape. So in the next five minutes, I'll cover what we're doing over at Sea Talent and how we ensure sex and disability is no longer a topic of taboo, but is actually front and center. So first, let's get to the core of the issue. Last year, uh, the New York Times collected research and illustrated how disability and sex remains largely unseen and or inaccurately depicted by non-disabled actors in movies and in streaming content. And you'll see in this graph that that's really the core heart of the problem. And even though the numbers of disabled characters on screen and in film continues to increase in the production industry, an estimated 95% of available roles are portrayed by non-disabled talent. So how do we solve for disability, especially in the context of sex and pleasure? Enter C Talent. C Talent is a disabled-led talent management and access consultancy. And just last year, C Talent was acquired by Whaler, a media creative commerce company. And through the collective power and through our use of social media marketing, as well as changing the way the, view, the world views and defines disability, we're changing the narrative of sex and disability representation. But we all know that we have a really long way to go to get us out of something I like to call the VVI box. And I know we're talking about sex, but no, that's not a sexually transmitted disease. That's actually villains, victims, and inspiration. And so what do we see? We see it in the film industry, villains, victims, and inspiration porn. We see it in films that you'll see up on the screen today, from James Bond movies to The Theory of Everything to the wonderful movie Wonder, which was all about inspiration porn related to disability. So what do these, all of these films have in common? Disabled people continue to be portrayed as a villain, as a victim, or as an inspiration, but not everyday people in relationships, in workplaces, or in society. So how do we get out of these boxes? Starts by disabled people in film represented in sexual and influential roles. It starts by including disabled people in TV and media in front of and behind the camera in beauty and power, sexuality, and influence. And you'll see that today on this slide, which is a <clears throat> creator represented by sea talent, Marsha L. She was the first disabled person to ever be on the front of Playboy magazine. And the next three slides will also take you through a few other examples of sea talent creators that we have worked with in both a consultancy capacity as well as in a talent management capacity to expand disabled representation in reach and sexuality as well as in marketing and in, within the film industry. Enter our work with Netflix, and if any of you back in December when this film was released on Netflix wanted to stay in and watch somewhat of a raunchy movie, this was it. Um, we had worked with Netflix in the winter months, as you can see, to launch Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was a classic D.H. Lawrence novel uh, released in the 1960s and was banned from very many uh, countries that had believed and thought that the book itself was actually too risque. And just like in Sumisi Coordinators, we worked with uh, the first disabled talent represented in this film, Matthew Duckett. He was the lead actor displayed and portrayed in the film to ensure uh, all of that, his access requirements. We had worked alongside him just as an intimacy coordinator. And from that, I'll read a short quote in which he had said something that was truly telling of how important it is to have an intimacy and access coordinator within these roles. Matthew had said, but something I was really grateful to see happen was to have sea talent on set dedicated to my needs as a disabled artist and to the honesty of the production of a disabled character and sexuality represented in film. So this is one example of how we can see uh, a disabled person in a role that 
articulate sexuality and disability. But sexual representation as it relates to disability needs to extend far beyond the big screen and in media. How about the front and center of content we see every day? This is Shelby Lynch. Shelby started front and center in this Glamour magazine uh, cover just last month. So you can go and check it out in London if that's where you're located. On this slide, you'll find this photo of Shelby, who was then talking within the article much about uh, how the fashion industry needs to not only be inclusive of disabled people, but the lingerie industry and sex toys as well. So on her social pages, you'll often find her discussing her uh, preferences on sexual toys as well as discussion um, with lingerie as it relates back to Savage Fenty, which is her favorite lingerie line, which many of you who have seen the Super Bowl, or maybe that's just me in the US, might have uh, seen how popular Rihanna got in recent months. But before turning back to our lovely moderators, I wanted to highlight two more creators who resemble the ultimate love story, because after all, it's February, it's the month of love, at least where I'm from. So let's get to rolling with Cole and Charisma. Cole and Charisma, also known as their uh, social media handles, Roll with Cole and Charisma, use their social platform with a reach of over two million people to address topics related to love, sex, and disability. And what's more is that their love story is just part of their everyday content. It's not inspirational, it's just love. So in closing, I wanted to articulate that we all know more needs to be done to ensure that social media platforms are accessible and also don't per perpetuate ableist biases. And as a united front, working with global brands and with organizations online and in front of cameras and behind cameras, we can change the world and in which it defines disability and sexuality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ella. Our panelists have uh, shown us a diversity of work in sexual health and reproductive rights. I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, and I think we have time for the second question um, on our question. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you, everyone, for that um, really great overview of the very innovative um, work that you're doing. And I think um, as someone who um, has spent like a, three decades working with people with intellectual disabilities to change the story around sexuality and relationships to one around rights and sex positive um, notions of sex and intellectual disability. I'm really inspired by the work, I'm sorry, use the word inspired, but I am, <laughs> by the work that you've done and that you shared with us tonight and how innovative it is. It is actually incredibly innovative. It's, it's gone across um, so many um, places and approaches and um, and I'm reflective of that as I as I as I you know put this pose this next question to you um, and some of you have touched on this is what's needed to sustain the work that you're doing um, to ensure that um, that we are really focusing on the sexual rights of people with disabilities um, and and I think centering people with disabilities within that voice uh, as many of you've talked about. Um, yeah, so uh, I think she in relation to sustaining um, the work that you do. Would someone like to answer that? Have thoughts? Maybe let's start in the back. <laughs> yeah, we can start back to the front, then Ellen. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think we had all discussed this in, in primarily in research as well as in putting disabled people front and center uh, within all of the work that we're doing, whether it is, again, behind, um, behind the scenes with the organizations that you are all representing here today, as well as making sure people feel seen and represented in everyday content that we're consuming. And so, at least in, in our personal experience, we've seen social media, um, really inhibit or not display disabled people. And that's a really big concern because if you're not seeing yourself represented in society, then you're isolating yourself. And at least in, in our work, that's something that we're trying to solve for because we all know how important it is to, to make sure 
the visualization that you have is something that you can consume and resonate and connect with as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree. And another thing to add on seeing persons with disabilities and being part of the conversation is, especially in the context of you know, quite a few of the organizations here that, you know, we're working in Southeast Asia. And of course, this is not a problem just for Southeast Asia, but, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, discomfort around talking about sex. And then you add in disability and then people thinking, you know, inf inf infantilizing their children with disabilities and not wanting to talk about sex. So what we would like to do is have more people with disabilities coming up and having conversations from like our local context who are confident to have these conversations and share that it's okay to have these conversations with other people. And then of course the other thing to sustain is funding. It's notoriously hard to get funding <laughs> for uh, sex education if it's not going down the medical protective, you know, uh, protection from abuse route, right? So more open-minded funders as well, I think to talk about a more robust, healthy view of sex and relationships and love. Yeah, uh, thank you. Like, um, I think that um, HR, HR or sex education is still taboo in Indonesia, but we believe that young people have the voice when they trust or they, they know how they, what they need. So we have to uh, provide opportunity for young uh, women, uh, young people uh, with disability and affected by leprosy. And then uh, we believe that they can involve because HRHR, we talk about intimacy, we talk about uh, pleasure, not about abuse, but how they accept the information and then they can talk about that. That's enough. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, in addition to uh, all the very important points that my for, um, uh, panelists uh, already pointed out. I think it's also important to really bridge the gap between the services that are provided by the traditional sexual and reproductive health and rights organizations to include persons with a disability and to mainstream the topic of sexuality and sexual and reproductive health and rights in all the work that we're doing with uh, children and young people with disability. Um, so it's indeed easier to talk about it across the board and that uh, everyone knows how to discuss it, uh, where to go to to discuss it, uh, and that it's indeed not something to be ashamed of, but something we should enjoy. Um, that's it, thank you. Uh, Lillian from Cameroon, would you like to respond to the question as well? Yes. You're muted again. All right, in my opinion, I think introducing sex education right from the home uh, with respect to um, children with disability, especially female children with disability, I'm so particular about females with disability, it will go a long way because if they find, if they, if they are comfortable discussing about sex, discussing about every issue surrounding sex from the house, from the home, they will be comfortable to discuss about it in public. So the, 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 the family has that responsibility to help these people work the aspect of being comfortable talking about sex. And another thing is our storytelling. Now, if they are comfortable talking about sex at home, then they will be comfortable talking about their story, telling their stories to their peers outside. So storytelling is a form of healing and it's a form of telling someone that you are not alone. You are facing, I'm facing what's situations than you. So it makes them come out of that shell and be confident enough to talk about those things that the society thinks they shouldn't talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question for our panel? We have a little bit of time. You can click your button and ask the question. It's hard to see with um, the Hi. light. Yes, please. Thank you very much all for your very nice presentations. Um, as a male educator in Austria, I was wondering how is the situation in general um, for 
um, also like education for people that are feeling male. Um, because in my feeling, um, there's a lot of, there's not much representation, at least in Austria. That's a great question. And uh, we're a little off balance in our panel in that we are an all-female panel that does not re represent the work um, of the organizations, I assure you. But I'm going to turn it to my, my panelists um, to talk about that. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. I was wondering how your work and your organizations do represent also work with males and, and um, the things that come with that. Uh, <laughs> it remains quiet. Um, <laughs> no, um, within the, uh, uh, the Body Talk program or the other uh, projects that Liliana Fons is doing on sexual and reproductive health and rights, we include all types of disabilities and all genders, um, and uh, we focus on both male and female and everything in between, including LGBTQI issues uh, and sexual uh, orientation, gender identity and expression uh, topics. Um, to make it as inclusive and intersectional as possible, because sexual pleasure is also a topic that concerns uh, not only females, but also men. Um, and in working towards a world with zero barriers uh, and no violence, I think that's everyone's responsibility too. So um, we try to be in as inclusive as possible in all our projects and approaches. Uh, yeah, I think I, uh, I'm agree with uh, Laura because we work together. <laughs> <laughs> we work together, so that's why that uh, we um, we uh, our NLR Indonesia we still uh, believe that young people are affected by leprosy and disability they uh, have to be enjoy with their sexuality because we are the same with without disability. So. Uh, why not we have to uh, dif separate or different? That's why we have to enjoy our sexual life and intimacy and pleasure about sexuality. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be totally upfront to say that in Singapore, we have one qualified sexologist <laughs> who can speak on this issue um, with, with sort of any sort of educational training behind it. Um, so we work with Dr. Martha because she's yeah, a qualified sexologist. And so we don't actually have representation of uh, male educators in this area. So it is definitely an area that we were tackling in our program because we were thinking about how do we get more voices, more educators in, and that's why we were looking outside of Singapore but we have the opposite problem that anyone that's been trained in this area is female in Singapore. <laughs> so um, it is definitely an area that we need to look into. So it's a great thing you brought up. And, but it's also to do with how it's such a new area in Singapore to talk about. Um, so we, we are skewed to a female perspective in, in our current program. Do uh, Liliana or, or Ella? Oh, yes. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Elvana Shala from Republic of Kosovo. I'm the ambassador of goodwill for Kosovo at International Human Rights Commission. Uh, the topic is very interesting, so I'm very pleased to hear uh, this kind of uh, conclusions and, and presentations from all of you. In my country, in the Republic of Kosovo, this, this topic is a little bit taboo. So we are not very much, how to say, aware to discuss about sex and disability because of a lot of prejudices that we have in my country. So I'm very much interested, uh, which is your opinion, how we can break these taboos and talk more and raise, raise the awareness about the sexual needs of the people with disability and how we can improve this kind of topic that to, to make people uh, feel us and make us feel integrated equal in society, even in this very much sen sensitive uh, topic that it is. Thank you. Great. Um, does one or two of you want to address that topic? We have just a short time for responses. Okay. 
Great, Ella. It's a great question, right? And, and something that we addressed in, in the presentation, which is you have to talk about it, right? And it has to be up front and center, whether it is in a magazine, whether it's in a film. You think about the best storytellers in the world, and those are typically from Disney. Those are, those are stories that resonate throughout time, right? Cinderella is still a theme and a thematic of movies and films and society that's still represented today. And so I think, one, it falls on brands as much as it falls on your society and your, um, and your public health as, uh, as well as your government. And so if you can't change the policies and, and the law, why not change that perception within society, starting with what people are consuming every day? And so at least within Sea Talent, we represent over 100 um, deaf and disabled talent. They're telling those stories online because that's where people, they're meeting people and those connections are forming. Uh, and you've seen tremendous progress and change with that in itself. Um, and there's quite a few stories I can, I can uh, detail into if, if you would like to chat after, but um, I, for us personally, we're seeing so much revolution and change happening on social media because that is one platform, which although it is flexing within regulation, it's where people are connecting, where a community is driving a force behind law and change in the real world. Thank you, Ella. Um, our time is coming to a close, and um, there's so much more to say, and we're just getting started on this topic. Last year, we had our first panel on uh, sexual rights and reproduction uh, rights and um, topics around sexuality, gender identity, and um, so we encourage you to talk with our panelists, the experts, um, and network with them, find out information, learn their stories. Um, and thank you so much for attending our panel. We'll be available after this session. Thank you.